church. Sorry for the technical difficulties. They're back there praying and laying hands on the, uh, on the computer right now. I think it's the anointing with oil part that might be messing it up. There's, there's sparks flying and some wicked stuff going on. So, First uh, John chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. So uh, get a head start and jump to that section of scripture. We're going to be looking at the last couple verses of chapter 2, first few verses of chapter 3. Before we do that want to um, let you guys know of opportunities we have to be a blessing to our community. One of the, the reasons, if you didn't know our website as a church, is, is not something cool like missioday.org. Our website is thechurchisaverb.org. And I always thought it was interesting, like, you know, when I throw that out there, like, people go, well, that's interesting, the church is a verb. Because what we're trying to live out of our faith in Christ is the idea of the the verbal nuances of what God's called us to be as his people. The church is not a building. The church is not an institution. Church is not brick and mortar. The church is us. And we are an organic movement. We are an organism, not an organization. And we have an opportunity to live as salt in our world we have an opportunity to live as light in our world and my philosophy is as we've been blessed we exist to be a blessing that was the promise to abraham back in genesis chapter 12 i'm going to bless you abraham so you can be a blessing to the nations and somehow i think the church has gotten a little bit off track and not just us but all churches and the world does not want to know what you believe The world wants to see your belief in action. I firmly believe that. And so we as a church have adopted some great opportunities for us to be involved in. And uh, I want to just give you those real quick and just let you know of our our outreach efforts, the, the ways we're trying to incarnate the spirit of Jesus in our culture and our world. We work with a a church in Slovenia. Mana's here. She's a, she's a Slovenian, uh, citizen and uh we have had the opportunity to get to know her folks her people the church pastor zvanko we support them financially we support them through prayer what an what an opportunity and the next time we have a trip planned to slovenia i hope you all get to go which means this will be an empty place on sunday morning but that'd be cool uh we have blessed works with refugees helping supply the refugees that are coming across the Mediterranean. We have helped an orphanage in dire need of supplies like diapers and wipes in Brazil. There's some cool international stuff that's going on that you guys, through your generosity, are able to be a part of. There's stuff locally that we're able to be a part of. Uh, we're working with a church in blessing the community in Houston right now after Hurricane Harvey. Your generosity is helping us send a gift just to help them out. Um, Things like that. It's awesome. What about our own community? Well, we do things like Feed My Starving Children. Who's been to Feed My Starving Children? That's an easy in. That's an easy way to serve. You get to listen to Journey and Def Leppard and pack boxes of food for kids in nations where literally they're eating dirt to survive. And we're just trying to send them something different. Every first Tuesday of the month, Ryan leads a group down to Mercy Hill Church downtown where every Tuesday they just send bags of groceries home with people who are probably just have empty fridges, empty cupboards, and we get to go down and just help them be a blessing to the downtown area of Phoenix. So first Tuesday of every month in the morning, if you're free to do that, jump in with Ryan. They love to take people down there and bless them. And we've had an opportunity to help them out too with some some financial stuff too. So uh, one of the newer things, Care Portal. If you're interested in Care Portal, check out careportal.org. And it is a nationwide organization that uh, exists to help the poor in our, in our own neighborhood. They are present in 33 states, and they are getting churches signed up right and left because, again, too many times I think we lean on the government and we lean on different social services to provide for needs. I firmly believe a lot of that responsibility is on us as the people of God, the church to take care of the less fortunate, to take care of the poor, the needy, the, the orphans, the widows, the oppressed, the marginalized, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have signed on with Care Portal, which means this. We have an opportunity to take care of physical needs of people that live within a 10 to 15 mile range of this church. 
this church, meaning where we're located right now, but you as the church are, you're scattered all throughout the week. But this is a chance for us to love our neighbors. And so here's what I want you to do with Care Portal. On your communication card, we are going to do an opt-in type system, which will mean if you give me your phone number, uh, we will text you an alert when a need arises in our community so that we as the body of Christ can respond to it. Okay? Because it doesn't do us any good just to announce it up front because that need could have been, it could be past three days. Uh, we need an immediate response to be the body of Christ in our, in our culture, in our community, in our own backyard. So if you want to opt in to just getting an alert about a need, uh, please write Care Portal on your communication card along with your phone number. Uh, text rate uh, of fees may apply. No, I'm just kidding. I, th- I just thought it'd be fun to say that. Um, Give us your number. It will not be passed out to anyone. It will be a closed group thing. You won't be uh, alerted to everyone else's numbers or information. But Ryan and John Ferguson are the guys spearheading this. And I just think it is an incredible opportunity dropped into our lap to just, again, be the body of Christ in our culture, in our, in our world. Uh, it's, it, the, it, the world, our culture does not want to hear us proclaim Jesus. They want to see us demonstrate Jesus. And I firmly believe that. So my prayer is we would get 30, 40, 50 people opting in to get a text message alert. And in that alert will be the specifics. A single mom needs a mattress for their two-year-old boy or else in a week that boy is going to be taken from the house. Who's going to pick this up? And someone says, we can do it. We can do it. Okay, who's got the mattress? Who's got delivery done? We've now saved a family from being fragmented. Do you you see how important this is? So things like that. So we are asking you to opt in. Write Care Portal on your communication card. Give us your phone number. And and what? Your name? That might be important. I don't know. (laughs) Hey, you. uh, Help. (laughs) Yeah, give us your name, your your Social Security number. um, give Give us your credit card. Be sure to include the three digits on the back of the card. <laughs> um, name, Care Portal. Just write Care Portal so we know what it's for, and then your, your phone number. You'll opt in, and then we'll just notify you when needs arise. And my prayer is that, boy, we would be just quick to respond with the spirit and love of Christ to, to the needs around us. Because sometimes we do, we're not aware, are we? We're not aware, and it, and it takes place right here in our own community. So, And what a... This is a state-backed organization. What an opportunity for the state to go, wow, churches really care for their community. Amen? Ryan, anything I'm missing on that announcement with Care Portal? Anything you would add? You're welcome. You're welcome. Not if you do it today, because if you put off what you do today, you won't remember tomorrow. So opt in, uh, opt in, take the card, put it in the mailbox on your way out, along with your generous offering, and we will be, we will be thankful for, for your gift. So you guys are a generous people. This is another opportunity for us to be generous. So you've been blessed, and so now we can be a blessing to others. Ryan. Except for us. Oh, and then we'll just blast out some weird memes every once in a while and be like, who's this from? <laughs> we good? Ryan, does that cover everything? Thank you, church. You guys are amazing. Uh, Brian Oliver and I, we just, we just look at the finances, especially through the summer. We just have been hitting well above our goal. And for us, the conversation is, right, who do we need to bless? Who do we need to, to take care of? Who, who needs help right now? And less for us, more for others. Amen. And you guys are a part of that. So a little tiny church community called Missio Day being a blessing across the globe. Awesome. You guys are awesome. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning and a time to, to celebrate your love for us in Christ and music. What a, what a time to just lift our voices and declare to you how awesome you are. Thank you for Jesus who makes life and hope possible. Thank you for our time now to dive into your word, and I pray that your spirit would have the freedom to to illuminate it, 
so that our minds and our hearts could grab a hold of the truths that lead to life and freedom. Father, be glorified in this time, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. First John chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning, and I'm sure most of us here have, have rented something before. Have you ever rented uh, a car? You know, have you ever, you know, I know, uh, you know, it's like that old Seinfeld episode, right? Oh, it's a rental, and we just kind of curb the car as much as we can, and we definitely want the insurance on the rental car, amen? Uh, you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? So, renting a house, renting a suit, you know, there's something about renting something, you know, in, in the back of your mind, you know you don't own it, right? And sometimes when you rent something and you don't own it, maybe you just don't take care of it the way you ought to, and so there are things in this world that are a, we're able to rent, maybe we can't afford to buy what we need right now, so we're going to rent as a temporary fix. But it's interesting because I came across two interesting stories over the past couple weeks of, of renting things that are maybe symptomatic of some deeper things. There's a hotel in Belgium right now that will rent you a goldfish to keep you company if you're traveling alone. Four dollars a night, they'll give you a goldfish. I mean, who better to watch uh, cable with and uh, eat an overpriced hamburger with in your hotel room as you're traveling? You know, there's a goldfish for rent. And I'm thinking to myself, are people this lonely? Are, th- are people this desperate? Obviously, there's a need. And so you can rent a goldfish. Perhaps even deeper and more discouraging is in Japan, there's a guy who started an organization where he rents out people to stand in for a parent, for a sibling, for a date. And people will call this guy's organization and they'll say, hey, uh, I told my parents I have a girlfriend and I really don't. I need a girl to be my date for a night. All right, we'll rent out the girl. Here's the, here's the rate. Now you have a rental girlfriend. Oh, I don't have a a relationship with my dad, and I'm getting married in six months, and I need someone to give the dad speech who's going to pose as my dad. And we'll rent out the dad to stand in for the dad that's absent. And this guy's making money galore for people to stand in these places that are empty, that are vacuous, that someone needs somebody there to represent something. And I'm thinking to myself, have, have we gotten to a place as a people, as a culture, as a, as a, as a society where, boy, we, we, we are, we're renting relationships now to somehow make up for something inside? And, then, and I think about the, 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 the temporariness of things, right? When you rent, you, you eventually lose it. Uh, that rental for a girlfriend will only be for three hours. The rental for the stand-in dad at the wedding will only be five hours. But there's something more permanent out there that I want to just point people to. And you know what it is. It's, it's God. And I never want us to approach God as if it's, it's, if it's just transitory, as if it's just temporary. See, what we have to understand is when it comes to God's love for us, it has nothing to do with your ownership of him. What it has to do with is his ownership of you. And when God owns something, let me just tell you, he owns it. When he says, I'm going to promise to bless you, he promises to bless you. When he promises to never leave you or forsake you, he promises to never leave you or forsake you. As we live in a culture where things come and go, and especially people in and out of our lives, there is one constant in the universe, and that is a God who has promised his steadfast love to you and me. Amen? We need to hear this message today because some of us, have felt the pain of of loneliness, of the absence of relationships, of living in a world that's filled with renting and not a world that cares about owning. But the one thing that we need for our hearts this morning is to be reminded of God's ownership of us. But there are evidences that are going to make this more concrete in our experiences, and that's why we turn to 1 John. So turn your Bibles there. Five things we're going to look at. End of chapter 2, beginning of chapter 3 of 1 John. Five key truths, assurances, certainties, whatever you want to call them, to allow our hearts to be anchored in this steadfast, concrete love of God. It's what we need right now. 
And John is going to write to this church some 2,000 years ago, and the truth is transferable to us today. The same God that loved these people then is the same God that loves us people now. And so here we go. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 28. Let's read, and then we're going to take apart these five verses with five points this morning. And now, little children, again, such an endearing way to to open up this section of, of Scripture, little children, abide in Him. That is key. Circle the word abide, underline the word abide, highlight the word abide. This is key to security. This is key to assurance, abiding in him. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him and in shame at his coming. And you know that he is righteous. You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. See how great a love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is. Pure. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Five things we're going to discuss this morning that are pulled out of these verses we just read. My prayer is that they would anchor our hearts in something so objective, something so real, we would all be encouraged in our journey of faith in Christ Jesus together. And they all stem from the, the idea of abiding. We have an intimate connection with Jesus. This is key. If we spend time with him, if we allow him to speak into our lives, if we have a chance to to pour over his teachings and his words and and we we live in such intimate knowledge of him, these things will spring forth. So abiding is key. And that's why we start each truth with the, the abiding idea. Abiding brings confidence, number one, at Jesus's coming. Abiding brings confidence at Jesus is coming. One thing we all agree on is that Jesus is coming back. Amen? Just like Al Green sang, and I'm not even going to attempt it right now, but Jesus is coming back. And the key idea here that John refers to in verse 28 is there's going to be one of two responses when Jesus comes back. Either you will have confidence or you will be ashamed. Now think about this if you would. See, what, what was... What is now hidden, what we don't see fully, will fully be disclosed at Jesus' appearance as he arrives again. The first time he came, he came as a lamb. He came as a, as a servant, right? The second time he comes, he's going to come as a lion, right, on his, on his steed. And uh, he's, he's going to come victorious. And yet we have this idea of perhaps what that could look like, but we fully don't understand. The thing is, we're, we're not on the planning committee when it comes to Jesus' second coming. We're on the reception committee. Let's remember this. See, so many of us want to figure out the day, the hour, the year, the circumstances. And let me just put it simply for you. Here's what Jesus says. No one knows the day or the hour. Right? If you're buying books by a guy who's told you when Jesus is going to come back, you're a fool. And part of me goes, I wish I could get in on that racket. Because they sell. They sell millions of books. And I just sit there and go, Jesus himself said, no one knows the day or the hour, which gives us an idea of the key theme that John's trying to refer to, and that's preparedness. You are not on the planning committee. You're on the reception committee, and you want to be ready because he could come at any point. He could come before the Cowboys game tonight. He could. He probably won't, but he could. Which means we ought to be prepared. And let me just tell you, this is such a major thought in the scriptures that we should be ever watchful, ever vigilant that Christ is coming back. And you better be ready. 
The question is, will you be confident at his arrival or will you be ashamed at his arrival? Let me talk about this real quick because it's kind of like a child who's awaiting his parents arrival to come home. One of my favorite things my, my kids used to do when they were younger, and I kind of miss this today, is that the moment I walked into the house, like they were ready to receive me with open arms. Now I walk in, it's like, hey, Dad, what's up? You know, it's like, man, I miss that. But what's really interesting is when I walk home and maybe one of the kids is missing, meaning they're hiding somewhere. And then I know something's going down. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, where's all the jovialness of my children? How's that for a good word, right? Where's the spirit of, hey, we're, Dad's home, and oh, where's so-and-so? And then Lori gives me the look, and I know someone is not behaving properly, right? They're not eager to receive me. They want to hide, right? Because they've done something that shamed them. And so there's this kind of idea here that John wants us to understand that there are going to be those who are prepared and have confidence when Christ comes, and there will be those who are ashamed. The key is, are you prepared for him? Because we can be, and this happens to all of us, unfaithful with what God's entrusted to us and unfaithfulness leads to being ashamed because one day you're going to realize that all the stuff you were living for doesn't matter in time and eternity all the time treasures and talents that God entrusted to you to use and leverage for his glory and his kingdom we were unfaithful with and now we have nothing to show for it see I don't think John is referring to those who don't believe in Jesus, I think he's referring to believers in Christ who are unfaithful stewards with the resources God's entrusted to them. See, you have to understand something, you guys, that there's, there's scripture passages that speak to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you read the passage that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, some of you, when that evaluation time comes in the future, will... Show the things that you've invested in with the resources God's entrusted to you and they will be like gold and they will be like silver and they will be like precious metals that as God tests them with his refining fire, they will withstand the heat. But there'll be some of you who have built your life with wood, hay, stubble and when that fire comes, you will be saved but barely smelling like burnt hair. That's the problem. It's like you're going to make it, but you're, there's going to be a momentary uh, sense of being ashamed because you've lived your life separated from doing what God wants you to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he continues to develop this thought into chapter 4. And the scriptures are clear. Every one of us who believe in Christ will one day be evaluated before him. And he's going to say, how did you do with all that money I gave you? How did you do with all those possessions I entrusted to you? Were you a good manager and steward, or did you think you were an owner? Because that's the problem. We have an ownership mentality, and we're really just managers. Because naked you came into the world, and how are you going to leave? Naked. And so we ought to be ready Realizing that God does not want me to plant my roots so deep in this world when he comes back, he's having a hard time pulling me out. That we ought to live with eternity in perspective. Someone once said, what we weave in time, we shall wear in eternity. That's good. I don't want us to have an Oscar Schindler moment. If you remember Schindler's list at the end of the movie, when he is breaking down at the side of his expensive car and he takes his ring off and he realizes he could have done so much more to save more Jews from from the death camps because he says this ring could have saved 3,000 more Jews. See, we become so entrenched and entranced with our treasures and our possessions. God says, you are not keeping an eternal mindset. Christ is coming back and he's not impressed with what you got. But he will reward based upon your faithfulness with what he's entrusted to you. Can I just tell you something? We live in a culture right now, and, I, and Christians are to blame. Christians are more excited about football starting than they are about Jesus coming back. 
Think about how everyone's just been like, oh, yes. I mean, the real question is not going to be, you know, how awesome will the Cowboys be this year? This, that's not the question. But what does NFL mean in light of eternity with Jesus? We get more excited about our football team than we do about our Savior. Shame on us. There is no football in heaven, guys. Okay? If God picked a quarterback, it might be Dak Prescott, but in the long scheme of things, it doesn't matter. You see, I'm, I'm trying to r- get a rise out of you. <laughs> kind of kind of poke where, where some of you are really sensitive about things, right? I love the comedian who says, uh, he's an Italian comedian, you can YouTube the video, where he talks about guests coming over when guests came over 20 years ago versus guests coming over today. Like, guests coming over 20 years ago, is like the doorbell rings, everyone gets up, it's like, yeah, we've got visitors, come on in, get the Entenmann's out, we're going to have a party, right? Today, guests come over, it's like, shh, get down, hide. We don't want anyone to sense there's life inside this house right now, right? Like, you need to know that when you abide in Christ, you can't wait for him to come. So you can run and jump into his arms and say, I've been waiting. I'm wait- I've been waiting and you're here. Not saying, boy, I just want to get married before he comes. I just want my football team to win the Super Bowl before he comes. I just want to get that last latte before he comes. I don't know what it is. But nothing matters more for the arrival, the eminent and transcendent arrival of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 promises a reward to those who eagerly anticipate His coming. There are rewards of heaven. The Bible speaks of this. But there's a reward for those who eagerly anticipate his arrival, and you will be doubly blessed by God for those of you who long for his appearing. Is that awesome or what? So remember this. Abiding brings confidence at Jesus' coming. Are you ready? Are you guys ready? Because I don't want you to be hiding. I don't want you to be ashamed. I want you to be ready when the ultimate bridegroom appears. We are like the bride that has prepared herself and said, take me. I'm ready to go. Second truth is this. Abiding brings certainty of new birth. See, there's something about abiding with Christ that just fuels this certainty that, yes, you are born again. See, verse 29 is interesting because it's the first time John introduces this idea of being born again. And this is a mysterious thing to those who don't understand it, but it's great assurance for those who do believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. The fact that you have been born again. This is the grounds for living rightly. The the life that God gives you, we're going to call this regeneration. Write that word down and research it later. The idea that God has changed your heart of stone into a heart of flesh so that you may believe. He's taken the blinders off your eyes and you once were blind, but now you see. God is the source of your birth. God is the originator of your new birth. He is the author of your new birth. The sad news is you can't take any credit for the new birth you have in Jesus Christ. The good news is you don't want to take credit because you can't contribute anything to your new birth. It's all of God. And John says, you have been blessed by being given new life, and this new life should translate into something, and here it is. You ready? Practice. What does he say in verse 29? If you're born of God, if you've been given this life of of new life from on high, your now new birth should translate into practice suitable to who you now are in Christ Jesus. This is the big thing right now in our world where people say the church is just full of hypocrites. How come you don't practice what you preach, right? The idea that our profession, if if I am truly born again, should translate into practice of being born again. If you're God's child, you should look like your father. Your practice is proof 
of your parentage. Your character governs your conduct. Righteousness in any believer's life is evidence, not grounds of new birth. Remember, you don't bring righteousness to the table. It is something that is brought forth through God's work in you, the very work he did at the very beginning, he will perfect according to his will in Christ Jesus, right? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. So you need to understand that everything we're talking about this morning has its root in being born again in Christ, which is solely a work of God himself. Are we clear on that? That's an important point to understand uh, and, and something you can't take credit for. Something you really do walk in, in humility before God with. It's like what John Newton said, who wrote um, Amazing Grace. He says, there are three wonders I'm going to experience when I get to heaven. One is the people I thought would be there are not there. The second wonder, are there going to be people there that I never thought would be there? And the third wonder is that I would be there. See, that's keeping it in perspective. The fact that you would even make it, not based upon anything you've done, but solely based on the work of God and what he's performed in you and through you, that is awesome. So abiding fuels the certainty that I am truly born again. I have new birth. Number three. Abiding brings clarity to our identity. So let me now piggyback on the last thought and go a little bit deeper with you about your identity that now you are a son or daughter of God. I mean, just write those words down. If you're, if you're a male, write son. If you're a female, write daughter. I hope Google doesn't fire me for taking a gender-specific route here. You're a son or daughter of God. Now, some of us would just, just gloss right over that. But there's something precious in being called a child of God. I do not subscribe to the world philosophy of the fatherhood of God over all people. God is not the father of all people. Can we be very clear on this? It sounds ecumenically wonderful, But God is the creator of all people. He's not the father of all people. You come to know God as father only through Jesus Christ, and then you become a child of his. In a word, you know what this is called? Adoption. One of the most marvelous biblical truths that you and I can abide in is that you have been adopted by God. Meaning there was somebody who didn't want you. There was somebody who maybe didn't care for you. There was somebody who couldn't take care of you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there is one who saw you and put incredible value on you, not because you yourself were valuable, but that they had the wealth and the riches and the grace to say, I want to lavish it on you. And now you're adopted into God's family and we sit there and go, whoa, yes. I was unloved by the world. The world doesn't care one bit for you, yet we we frantically try to please the world, don't we? And what do we get back? Nothing. What have you done for me lately, right? And yet God says, and even John, look at verse 1 of chapter 3. What love. Consider for a moment the love of God that has been lavished on us. Literally, the, the original meaning behind this is How otherworldly is God's love for us? Nothing in this world can even describe the love of God for us. You ever use that phrase, out of this world? Oh man, that pizza place is out of this world. That movie was out of this world. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the one thing that is truly out of this world. It is God's love for you. You are now adopted into the family of God and He calls you son and he calls you daughter and with that comes an ever faithful ever consistent committed love where he says nothing will ever separate you from my love in christ jesus that is awesome see so with regeneration he changes our nature with adoption he changes our name 
So John says, stop and just celebrate how awesome God's love is for us. You were unwanted, you were neglected, you were uncared for, but now God has given you the greatest thing any human being can ever receive, and that is eternal life in Jesus Christ, new birth. And if he gave you that, according to Romans 8, why do you doubt that he's going to give you all other stuff in Christ Jesus for your joy, for your good, for your holiness? Amen? And we need to, we need to go take this message to the world. Because there are people who feel isolated and there are people who feel lonely. Can I, can I, I'm going to get on a political soapbox. <laughs> Three letters, D-A-C-A. Yep, we're going there. You want to know why? We are at a pivotal place right now. I may not agree what Obama did with executive overreach. We can't do nothing with Donald Trump, what he put forth last week. But right now we stand at a pivotal place as a nation and we need to pray for Congress and we need to let our elected officials know that there are men and women in this country who were brought here as kids, almost a million of them. And our spirit is the spirit of Christ in us, knowing that we were foreigners, we were aliens, we were strangers, and I thank God that he didn't cast us out and deport us. The biblical message right now is that God is going to use us to love these people. They're in our country. They've been given to us as a gift. Now we have an opportunity to love them because we send missionaries overseas and try to reach these people. Now they're in our backyard and we want to get rid of them. Shame on us. God has always had a heart for the needy, the poor, the marginalized, the immigrant, the, the, the outcasts, the wid widows and the orphans. Let me tell you something right now. I do not agree with a president who says we close our borders. I do not agree with Congress who says we need to deport people. These are young men, young women that are trying to build a life here. What do we do? We don't vote along political lines. We vote along spiritual lines and say, who was I? I was an outcast, and God welcomed me in. I was a foreigner, and yet God loved me. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, DACA is an important moment right now, and I'm going to tell you as your pastor, you don't have to agree with me. I mean, you can be wrong. That's fine. That's your choice. But I'm going to tell you right now, you tell me deporting somebody that was brought here, not that they had a choice in it, and you want to send them out. Now, again, criminals is one thing. That's a small portion of the group I'm talking about. And how the hell did you get here to begin with? Where did your ancestors come from? We are about life. We are about promoting something whole and healthy. And by all means, we have the opportunity to share the love of Christ with perhaps some of these people. Pray. Because I don't want to be a part of a community that continues to marginalize people. That's not the spirit of Christ. This is why I tell you as the church, because, you know, Jesus had the worst, the hardest things to say to the religious people. I'm going to have the hardest things to say to you as the religious people. Quit trying to be right and just be in relationship. And look for opportunities to love people. Because they're coming to us. And you know what? We better be ready to receive them with the spirit of Jesus. Because at that point, it's talking about human-on-human -human relationship. It has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It has nothing to do with the R or D after their name. It has to do with you exhibiting the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Off the political soapbox. Okay? You need to be clear. And, and I, along with other evangelical leaders, uh, believe the same thing. Don't let social media, don't let the news put this fear into you that is unbased and certainly not grounded in Scripture. When will we step up and realize that your life is not based upon political, partisan, voting, and political lines? Your life is based on the Scripture. How dare you send somebody away that God has brought to you because He's ultimately sovereign over these things that now you have an opportunity to love. 
I said it, there it is, hate me forever, I love you. Okay? And if you're interested in more materials, I'll send you articles. If that's your thing, I'll send you articles. You cannot debate this topic biblically and be in support of deportation. The Bible biblically says you have a theology when it comes to the immigrant, and it better be to welcome them and love them. Mic drop, boom. Point four. <laughs> Abiding. You guys realize we're all in all these precarious situations because government officials make dumb choices. Yeah, right? And, and there's, there's blame across all the party spectrum. I'm not, I don't care about the party spectrum as far as the, my sphere of influence. I care for you that you would be equipped and prepared to do a good work out there regardless if you're in the minority, regardless if you may be the only person. I, I could care less if people disagree with me. I know I'm right. Why? Because it's not because I feel this way. It's because the bi- Bible supports this. Talk about a, You want to talk about like a town hall meeting sometime we should host at Sozo, right? What does the Bible say about the immigrant? A lot of us would be amazed at what it teaches. Where were we? Oh, yeah, point four. More loving, more gracious. Abiding brings conformity to the image of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus brings us more than just a rescue. The gospel of Christ brings us total transformation. Write that down. Notice what John says in verse 2. He says this. Beloved, now we are his children, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. This is a thought, this is a theme, this is a truth that we, as as a community, agree with, that God, according to Romans 8, is conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. Isn't it good news that God's not conforming you into the image of Brenda? God's not conforming you into the image of Scott? God's not conforming you into the image of Kevin. Who else said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out right now. <laughs> See, these people, Brenda's wonderful, Kevin's wonderful, I may be wonderful. But no one is more wonderful than Jesus, and the only game plan God has for you is to make you more like Christ. Okay? Don't lift anyone else up on a pedestal. We can follow others as they themselves follow Christ, but our penultimate goal in all this is surrendering to what God wants to do in us to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And right now, he's doing that. Right now, he's, he's making us more look like Christ. And this is part of the abiding process. You will become like those you spend time with. Your relationship with Christ is secure. It's like the baseball uh, player that gets up there and hits the home run, right? A home run's a home run. What does that player have to do before they put a run up on the board? They have to run the bases. But the good news is, he can never be called out. He's got a guarantee home run. And that's why they cruise around the bases. They don't take too much time, but they're not sprinting. Why? Because there's a security in knowing that, hey, the run's been scored. I've got to do what I need to do, but no one can call me out. Isn't that the good news about faith in Jesus Christ? is that there's nothing that the enemy can do to try to dissuade you, uh, to to try to get you off course. He's going to try his best, but you abiding in Christ have this central anchor that says, no, God's doing a good work in me. And I love what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, what the eye did not see and the ear did not hear and never entered the human mind, what God has prepared for those who love him. You have no idea what God's got in store for you. See, this is why there's this sense of anticipation within the believer's heart. This idea that I have a taste of the glory to come. I have a taste of of what God's prepared for me. But you're just merely tasting the appetizer right now. The main course has not arrived yet. And that's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, For now we see dimly as through a mirror, but one day what we've known now in part, we will one day know in full. And can I tell you, the face-to-face encounter you will have with Christ when he appears will blow your mind. See, right now, there's conformity. One day, there's total transformation. 
right now as we walk in abiding with him, we can taste it, we can taste it, we can taste it. But one day it will be full disclosure. And what a day that will be. The Bible says this is our blessed hope. This is the promise of his coming that you will be transformed. And the beautiful part about all this is no longer will you have to do battle with sin. You will be free from the very presence of sin one day. Amen? See, you're saved, you're free from the penalty of sin in Christ when you believe in Jesus. Right now, we're learning what it means to be free from the power of sin in our lives, but one day we'll ultimately be free from the presence of sin, and that is what we look forward to. So John says, what you're only seeing dimly now, one day will be made fully known to you. Yes. Last point. Abiding brings consecration in our behavior. You guys, I'm not going to let you off easy. You've got to dig deep into that vocab memory of yours. Consecration. I'm going to thank my Puritan forefathers for that word. At least I didn't give you mortification, right? Consecration. What does consecration mean? I'll, tell you what, I'll give you guys a softball. I was hard on you with some politics a moment ago. Here we go. Cleansing. How's that? Is that better? Some of you are like, where's the cue in consecration? There's no cue in consecration. Cleanse, how about cleansing? Meaning, as you abide and you're being conformed into the image of Christ, there's an awareness, a constant daily awareness of the cleansing, meaning moral purity, meaning moral righteousness, meaning moral uh, 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 just purity in our lives. Holiness. Look at verse 3. And everyone who has this hope, what's the hope? That as we abide in Christ, there's this idea that he's coming back, right? And we need to be ready to meet him. And has the fit, their, uh, their hope fixed on him and does what? Purifies himself as he himself is pure. Who is the most righteous man that ever walked the earth? Jesus. Who's the most holy person that ever came into our world? Jesus. And now those of us who have our hope fixed on him will act in a manner just like him. Our conduct looks like Christ. The pattern of our purity looks like Christ. This is why some translators have, have called this the idea of there's little Jesus is now running all over the world. You're a little Jesus if you're in Christ. And so John says, live out your purity, live la- out your righteousness, live la- out your holiness. And I'm going to tell you a great passage, Colossians chapter 3. Write that down. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, says, Don't set your mind on the things of the earth, but set your mind on the things in heaven, right? So that when you set your mind on the things in heaven, your life that is now hidden with Christ will be fixed there, and when Christ, who is your life, appears, you're also going to appear with Him in glory. And so what we need to understand now as followers of Christ, believers in Jesus, is this. There are things that we do that can either bring our Father great joy or there's things that we can do that bring our Father in heaven great unhappiness. It's like when I was younger, in faith, teenager, which was a long time ago. I say younger because it seems like decades ago, which it it was. So, But when God sees my heart in Christ as a 15-year-old, you know, I hung out with the stoner crowd. It was interesting because I was part jock, part stoner. And I was able to get football games together between the jocks and the stoners in North Scottsdale. And this was a fun little group, right? But I was hanging out with this crowd. And, you know, as you get older, there's the temptation to, to smoke, to drink, to whatever. And as God just reminded me of his fatherly love toward me, you know, there would be this invitation. Hey, you want to come over for this party? And I would decline the invitation. Not because I was more righteous or more holy. I just, just like, and, and my friends would say this. Oh, what, you're afraid your dad's going to get mad at you? And I responded, it has nothing to do with my dad getting mad at me. It's that I don't want to do anything to dishonor my dad. And all of a sudden, it started to, to make sense. That my life in Christ is on a trajectory knowing that my father loves me nonetheless. 
but that I want to live my life in a way that makes my, my father happy with me. That I love being his child and there's nothing I would do to ever malign his character, his work, his word, his truth. And that's the perspective that we need to consider right now. As we, we depart this place, because the world's going to bombard you. Will today be the day you say, yes, for me and my house, we're going to honor the Lord. Me and my life, it doesn't matter what my friends may want me to do, no matter how they may want to influence me, I'm going to live my life of purity and holiness only by the power of God, because only He can help you live this life. And you're going to live it with a perspective of saying, why would I do something to bring dishonor to the love that God has shown me? That's my prayer for you, church. Will you do that? Will you go out and you live your life this way? I'm going to pray for you in that. What assurances? You guys like it? These five things, take it with you. Leave here. Don't let your mind, I know some of you are thinking just on DACA right now. You're like, I'm so mad at you, pastor. Forget it. Because in light of eternity, the other things I've brought up are much more important for you as a believer. And I'm going to pray that you would be used of God in your culture in this world for the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. It's good to be with you. It's, a good, it's good to get truthful with you. It's good to get political with you. It's good to yell at you. It's good to cry with you. It's like we're in relationship with each other or something. Father, you are awesome. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this community, this family. Lord, it, it is a joy and an honor to be able to call these men and women brothers and sisters in the faith. My prayer is that you would perform your will, your work in us. For, forgive us for the ways we've been a hindrance to that. And I pray that by your spirit we would have strength to, to cooperate with you and to sense, once again, your voice in our lives and for the direction for our path. Help us to live for your glory. Help us to point people towards the kingdom. And this is only possible because of Jesus. May we never lose sight of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace and mercy forever. God bless you guys. Have a great one. Bye-bye.